they are saying this is a trans woman. In 2022, our twin daughters came to us and told us they didn't feel like the genders that were given to them. They have four children, and guess what? All of them happen to be trans. I don't care if that murderer identified as a woman or, or is a woman. I care that she was a murderer. She said that she is a woman. I feel like being a psychopath and deranged just makes you look really ugly and really old. Robbery is up, knife crime is up, rape is up, taking most of it, vehicle offences is up, residential burglary is up, knife crime with injury is up, knife crime with injury and robbery is up. And you think, honestly, that London is more safe now than when you took over the mayor of London. Right. Stop telling your trans kids they love you no matter what. I don't have particularly positive views on Islam, and why would I? Why would I? We decided to seek out professional help in the form of a gender clinic. Oh yeah, of course the child is already at the gender clinic. How old is this child? Like eight? Both of my children have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, and both are currently receiving gender affirming care. Hi everyone, you are very welcome back to the Jack Jewel podcast. Whether you are watching on our YouTube channel, listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, I am very glad to have you back here with me. And if you do enjoy this content, please make sure you subscribe, click the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. Or if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, follow me, leave a review if you can. So this week, a lot has happened. It's been a very controversial week in the UK. So some of the stories I'm going to touch on today are sensitive in some regard. Before we get started, I just want to say that make sure you're doing your own research. As always, don't take any of my opinions as sacrosanct. However, I'm going to tell you what I think about all these wild and crazy stories. So let's get started. JK Rowling says, I'm sick of this shit after transgender cat killer is called a woman. Harry Potter author hits out at reporting of Scarlet Blake case as it emerges judges have been told to respect people's self-declared gender. You've probably heard of this story already, but there is a trans woman in the UK who committed some heinous acts against a cat and then a very tragic murder. So let's look at what that was first. Okay, cat killer sentenced to life for Oxford murder as part of a sexual fantasy. Scarlett Blake, 26, targeted George Martin Carreño, 30, as he walked home from a night out in Oxford in July 2021. So this obviously happened a long time ago. The trial has obviously taken a very long time. The murder came four months after Blake live-streamed the horrific killing of her neighbor's cat. Blake used cat food and a carrier to lure the pet. Setting up a tripod and camera, she suspended the cat with a ribbon before cutting it open. So apologies, I didn't say anything about it, trigger warning here. But that is just absolutely disgusting. I am in two minds. Well, actually, I'm not at all. I've, I'm not happy referring to this person as she, her, and a woman whatsoever. Um, so during his evidence... He claimed that he had fragmented personality, which included being a cat and meowed at the jury to show how he would interact with friends. Hmm. Obviously, it goes without saying that this crime is absolutely disgusting. And a lot of attention has probably been drawn away from the fact because certain news outlets in the UK initially reported on this story without referring to the fact and clarifying this individual is trans identifying. So this individual was clearly born ma male and he identifies as a trans woman. So Sky, Sky News, The Guardian, BBC all failed to mention this fact. Let's see the report from Sky. A uh, woman has been found guilty of murdering uh, an individual in Oxford months after she filmed herself um, killing a, a cat. Scarlett Blake has been sentenced to life. This has been an incredibly grim case. Some of the details we've been hearing this afternoon have been absolutely harrowing. And Mr Justice Chamberlain has given this life sentence with a minimum sentence of 24 years for the murder of Jorge Martin Carreño. And also because of the way that the, a cat was also mutilated and murdered four months before the murder of uh, Jorge took place. Uh, we heard from the judge that uh, Scarlett Blake had an obsession with harm and death. And we heard from the judge of a number of grim details, which has... Okay, so does this sound like the behaviour of a woman? I don't think so. Granted, I can acknowledge that there are women out there who commit terrible crimes. However... It is very atypical for a woman to possess a sadistic 
nature and you know proclivity of wanting to cause violence and this is clearly someone who is obsessed with harm with violence with torture so the fact that we are acknowledging this person in our news as a woman just shows how insane this climate has got to god knows what possessed them to do this and i am just going to mention that there is a possibility that they did not know this person was trans identifying i would be very suspect of that seeing as this happened several years ago there's obviously been an ongoing trial it's probably quite clear that this has been mentioned before but god knows why they have failed to call this out because you would sort of think if i try and understand it i can say okay they're aware the political climate is hostile towards trans issues and they probably want to avoid any backlash however Surely they know at the same time that if they fail to mention this person is a man, is male, then they will get just as much, if not more, backlash from the majority of the female population. And just the fact, you know, I'm tired of trans being an all-encompassing thing and even a lot of the trans activist community just not being able to acknowledge, okay, there are some people who identifies trans and the reasons are probably less pure or valid than the reasons of others. And it's okay to acknowledge that without diminishing your cause. So if this person is sadistic and violent and they have stated that he has a fragmented personality, which includes being a cat, then how can we take the female identity seriously in any way? And In any regard, I think no matter what crime it is, I feel when it comes to policy, when it comes to legislation, it's very important that it is clear as day what biological sex this person has. I'm totally fine with a news outlet reporting, you know, in their very first line, this transgender woman who committed these acts. Personally, when it comes to pronouns, and I've sort of developed my feelings about this over time, right? Pronouns is a nuanced issue, and I definitely sit somewhere in the middle. I'm not, like, extreme gender critical. Um, I will never call anyone by the correct pronoun. Definitely not. But then I'm not just the blind affirmation side as well. So for me, I feel pronouns are an act of courtesy and politeness. I do have compassion for trans people who are obviously going through a lot and have transitioned. Whether that transition is helping them or not, they're still going through quite a lot. So if it is a binary transition, you know, I don't do they, them, which I'm sure lots of you have picked up on from other podcasts and other YouTube videos I've made. But for she, her, he, him, I am usually quite happy to do it if provided that person is respectful. And typically we're looking more at, you know, men identifying as women, trans women. If they are disrespectful towards women, if they are coming up on TikTok saying, I'm a lesbian and if you don't like me, you're transphobic. If they are infiltrating women's changing rooms, exposing their genitalia or trying to change prisons and get access to women, then they've lost their courtesy from me. And I have no problem calling them he, him because the entitlement we see is more common in men and it is all too evident in this case. Even when it comes to autogynephilic men, there are lots who acknowledge, well, maybe not lots, but there are more who are acknowledging this as the case, who understand the difficulties surrounding women's spaces. And for them, I also don't believe that their desires and their sexuality are something to be ridiculed or something to be, you know, entirely distasteful, disgusting. I feel like most of them, they can't, they can't change it. Do you know what I mean? So I think as long as their values, for me, it's about values. If your values are in check, I believe I have no problem calling you by that. And I'm not sure how I feel about the gender critical argument that if you don't use the, the biological sex pronoun, then it's impossible to create meaningful legislation and policy. Surely we can use she, her, he, him, but then in policy, make it very clear. However, if they are trans identifying, then X, Y, Z. Perhaps maybe that's me just not knowing enough about policy. Who knows? Um, But Debbie Hayton, who is a trans woman in the UK, and Debbie speaks 
a lot, um, you know, very similar opinions to my own, I suppose, is again, self ID is very aware of women's spaces, and has broken free of the fantasy of the fact that you know, she is a real woman. I recently wrote a book, which I read, and I thought it was absolutely great. It's called transsexual apostate, my journey back to reality. I believe hope I'm not misquoting that. But she had a very easily accessible to understand description of pronouns in that pronouns are more about perception. So she said, if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So when it comes to passable trans women, then you actually have to put in a conscious effort not to call them she, her, he, him. And that's not really the way the world works. Also, when it comes to the bathroom debate, even if we have a third option in every establishment, in any country in which medical transition is allowed, and provided, I believe that it should be policy to have third option bathrooms. But even with that being the case, passing trans women will probably still go, there will be a percentage that go into the female bathroom. And I don't know how they can control that because if we're providing the medical treatment, there are inevitably going to be trans women who pass. And I think the gender critical, extreme gender critical argument is of, I don't think anyone can fully pass. I think that is bullshit. I really don't believe that. I don't think anything can be a blanket statement such as that. And maybe it's my maleness talking, but I've seen many trans women who, you know, I'd find it very difficult to to ascertain the difference. Um, but back to this story, obviously JK Rowling has been platforming it. And she posted on Twitter, I'm so sick of this shit. This is not a woman. These are hashtag not our crimes. So I'm very glad that she's continuing to speak up about this, despite all the backlash she is facing. And I think the fact that she's choosing to focus on the trans prisoner situation, trans women in sports, less on the bathroom side of things, um, is very important because these are the most vital cases that we need to talk about. There is no way we can put male people in female prisons. And I recently did a reaction video, you may have seen it, to university students who were all saying like, yeah, put them in the male prison. And even if they were sex offenders, they were saying, well, it depends, all of them female as well. So you can see that, you know, my interpretation is that queer or LGBT people and girls are, their empathy is being exploited for the sake of trans rights and because trans are quote-unquote the most oppressed then their rights do trump trump women's rights and even if that means they're going to forfeit their own rights then they will and i've said this before but the unfortunate thing is a lot of these people come from middle class liberal people who will never or nor have ever had to face the complexities of being in prison of going to a women's shelter and if they do have to face it one day perhaps they will understand, oh, wait, this is not what I thought it was. I don't want to fear being in a cell next to a male who raped a woman. That is insane. So great that JK Rowling is speaking about this. And it wasn't just this story, but she spoke about some other cases. So we see one here. That thing only evil, nasty bigots claim happens and that never ever happens has happened again. From this story, it basically has emerged that there are guidance for judges telling them to respect gender identity within court. So the guidance which features in the Equal Treatment Bench Book produced by the Judicial College, difficult word for me to say, says it should be possible to respect a person's gender identity and their present name for nearly all court and tribunal purposes, regardless of whether they have obtained legal recognition of their gender by way of a gender recognition certificate. It also tells judges that a person's gender status should not be disclosed unless it is necessary and relevant to the legal proceedings. It also tells judges that a person's gender status should not be disclosed unless it is necessary and relevant to the legal proceedings. Campaigners have warned that the advice could lead to public perceptions and the statistics on women's crime being skewed. So that is the key point, is that we cannot just blindly affirm males under trial, especially for violent crimes, and refer to them as women because there is a chance that this will then inform data of, you know, it's important for us to collect data on how many homicides were there this year committed by men, committed by women, so that we can see if there are any changing trends in human behavior in society. And if we are recording these as women, then, oh, suddenly 
we've seen a big spike in female rapes, which obviously doesn't make any sense. And I think any policy or advice, which is a blanket one, is never going to be a good situation because uh, the advice is just respect someone's gender identity. And we keep coming back to the fact that gay and trans is always lumped together. So anyone would probably say, if a gay man is in court, you need to respect his sexuality and not say anything homophobic. That kind of goes without saying. I'm not sure, unless you are homophobic, who could disagree with that. Gender identity is viewed as the same thing. Everything is put through the same lens as homosexuality, and that is the issue. Because in order not to be quote-unquote transphobic, then you should never not say the gender identity pronouns which someone identifies with. However, in a case where a man has brutally murdered a cat and another man, then I believe they should have lost their privileges. That is bullshit. There's no point pandering to the murderer during that trial. And of course, innocent to proven guilty, you may argue that point, which I can understand. But that's that's just how I feel. And JK Rowling has not only been speaking out about this case, but there's been several other tweets of her in the last week. So we see another one here of JK Rowling says, quote unquote, it happened again as a man caught filming in toilets identified as a woman. So this is Curtis Mawson, 22. I think it's funny with some criminals... <laughs> This guy, if if he was listed as 40, I would honestly believe it. I feel like being a psychopath and deranged just makes you look really ugly and really old. <laughs> so can't believe this guy is 22, but he's obviously aged an incredible amount from being such a disgusting person. So he secretly filmed women in a public toilet and sexually assaulted a tourist on Durham City Bridge. So Durham is a county in the north in England. When an officer asked if anybody was in there, the perpetrator allegedly put on a high-pitched voice and answered, yeah. Disgusting. The prosecutor said when challenged with what he is doing in a woman's toilet, he said, just chillin'. He then said he was there as he identified as female. And J.K. Rowling is acknowledging in this case that while we make the argument, if we allow men into women's spaces, if we allow trans women, all trans women into women's spaces, then there will inevitably be men who abuse the system. And trans people say that that's not happening. That's not that's not going to happen. But she is shedding light on the fact that it is happening. And these are just the reported cases. Who knows how much more it's happening? And the fact that if you're for trans rights, I understand and I am for trans rights too, and I support trans people. But if you are for that, and you are also able to simultaneously deny the fact that this is happening, what kind of person does that make you? Because you're probably also someone who identifies as a feminist, and anti-patriarchy, -patri and, you know, d dumps on men for all the problems. But then... You're ref refusing to acknowledge the men that are taking abuse of the system. So I just wonder what kind of feminist does that make you? Might be a good thing to think about if you fall in that camp. However, you're probably not listening because if you avoid these stories, you'll probably avoid my podcast. Let's be real. Another tweet she put out was, statistics don't lie. Some, not all, trans-identifying males have committed sexual and violent offenses against women and girls. Some male per predators have capitalized on gender identity activism to claim a trans identity they never espoused pre-conviction or assault. Exactly the point I just made. If we think about situations in which men have abused power and roles in order to get to victims like priests, Catholic priests, teachers, coaches, the list goes on. Why would this be any different? Why is this the one case where a pedophile or a sex, uh, a sex offender would go, oh no, but that's the trans issue. No, I'm going to respect that. Absolutely not. There are people out there who will do anything. And it makes you kind of think about this. It's like less of a trans issue. It's more of a male issue. And the issue is that if you give men an ability to gain access to women in whatever way that is, or access to vulnerable people in whatever way that is, then there will be men who abuse it. So trans or not, it's open for abuse and it will happen. This has been actively happening in, pri in prisons. And 
some of it I feel has been going under the radar. We see another article here, menacing trans prisoner found dead in a cell after moved to women's jail blocked. So Tiffany, what a name, Tiffany Scott, also known as Andrew Burns, has a reputation as one of the UK's most violent inmates and died on Thursday, age 32. The Scottish Prison Service age 32, the Scottish Prison Service confirmed. Police Scotland said it had responded to reports of a 32-year-old woman taking on well. The cause of death is uncertain. I'm not really going to focus on that. I don't know why it happened. But this person was being held in a male jail cell come a year after a planned move to a women's facility. So this was planned, (laughs) was blocked in the wake of Isla Bryson scandal. This was a trans quote-unquote woman. I don't believe that. Um, who was sent to a female prison in Edinburgh and caused a lot of controversy, naturally, as he was a double rapist. And just look at this person. They are saying this is a trans woman who literally has no characteristics of a female body whatsoever. And there were actual plans to send this person to a female prison. What the hell? Just think about that. It's absolutely insane. I don't understand. There are no, this is the issue with no gatekeeping. It's all about your internal sense of self. So why would you bother get surgery and go on hormones, that kind of stuff? Very glad that this person did not get put in a female prison. And JK Rowling also retweeted this post from the Women's Right Network. And it is a sort of amalgamation of all of these different cases we've seen over the last few years of men identifying as women trying to gain access to female prisons. So definitely worth having a look at her page as they do follow that up with a thread and a description of every case. Um, And then before we move on, I want to (laughs) give us a look at this woman from the Pierce Morgan show because She really does my head in. Like, I, my blood boils when I watch her. Her name is Ava Evans. And of course, she seems like a sweet woman. But her opinions are always so wild and anti science. And I feel like she takes the opposite. She's always on the very far liberal opinion to everything. Let's just play the clip. So the murder rate will look like more women are committing horrific murder crimes than historically they've been doing because transgender killers now get categorized as women. I find the argument confusing because I don't, I don't care if that murderer identified as a woman or, or is a woman. I care that she was a murderer. I mean, I don't, Rose West was a biologically born woman. I don't identify with her. But do you her think, do you think that Scarlett Blake is a woman who committed that murder? Well, she said that she is a woman. I don't really think... And that's it, enough for you? But it doesn't, it doesn't do anything for me. I don't really care. But it literally I, I, will change I, like, the statistics. I think, I think, I think, I think it does but matter. But she was a murderer. But no, but I, I, think, I, I think it does matter because it matters in how we view uh, sort of public policy and the way we craft public policy. We know that 70% of, of transgender women in prison are are in there for sex, sex, sexual offences, right, against biological women. And that matters. You're saying this person is just a statistic, but actually they make up, they paint a broader picture. This person is clearly a biological man who has committed a heinous crime and in the name of women. That should offend you because it's, it's fundamentally it a fault. That's what gets also, me is that, Ava, you, you're, you're all me. for women's rights, right to the point that something like this happens and you don't seem to care. But it's nothing to you do with... You don't care about trans women dominating females in sport. It's nothing to do sport. with women's rights. You don't care about women... any of these issues. Because the point is, is that is that this, this, this woman has said that she is a woman and that doesn't have any bearing on the crime that she committed. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to acknowledge the fact that she sort of makes a point in the sense of we're focusing too much on this issue and not of the, the violent act. I sort of agree with that. But just like I said, she's willing to throw... Women, women's rights under the bus. And she is always on this show arguing for trans rights, arguing for schools to not have to disclose a trans identity to parents. So removing children's rights, talking about trans women being allowed in female sports. It just really pisses me off when a... I don't want to stereotype here because I hate the whole putting people in boxes. But a presumably sort of privileged, what quote-unquote white, um, liberal woman wanting to be virtuous 
and wanting to be inclusive will just sacrifice all of these important issues for the sake of diversity and inclusion. There is not a single woke talking point that I've seen on his show that she has conceded on or agreed with rationally. So I'm thinking of sort of doing a video on her at some stage because she really winds my gears. Is that the phrase? I always get phrases wrong. But finally, we can see that 70% or more transgender prisoners are in for sex offenses or violent crimes. And at least 181 of 244 transgender inmates, more than 74%, are in jail for crimes including rape, forcing underage children into having sex, grievous bodily harm, and robbery. Up to 144 of them, so men who identify as females, are housed in male prisons, while five are currently imprisoned in female jails, including at least one top security institution where murderers and terrorists are being detained. Obviously, whatever institution that is, is extremely problematic. Perhaps if it is a top security one, they are sort of housed separately. But I guess I'm pleased to see that the majority of them are housed with males in this country. We haven't had as many issues as other countries in this case. I wonder what delineates the difference between the trans women that have made it into female prisons in the UK versus those that have not. But I said this before, gender dysphoria is a mental disorder and there's nothing wrong with having a mental disorder. However, people that have mental disorders also tend to cluster with other things and people who have mental disorders are more likely to be violent people or criminals, convict, cr um, commit crimes. Now, that goes for every mental disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline personality. So it by no means reflects everyone and of course by no means reflects trans people as a whole. And I would suspect that many of these people are just appropriating the identity for the sake of being protected or getting access to females. But I would really like to see a turn in the LGBT community and the trans community of calling this shit out. You know, Pink News, GLAAD, um, the trans activists, if they're able to just acknowledge, sorry, but this is not one of us. We do not accept this person and they are taking advantage of the system. But the problem is you have some who say, well, if we deny this person is a woman, then that means there is a flaw in our argument of trans women are women full stop. And there are also other people who just don't want to draw any more attention to the situation and get bad publicity for themselves. But I actually feel like them ignoring it makes the situation worse because then the only news headlines that the UK audience is receiving widely are negative ones about trans people. And if more of them spoke out, I feel like then people would be able to see, okay, th there's, there's nuance to the situation. We obviously can't blanket everyone as this. So it's not only the case that news outlets are obscuring the truth by ref refusing to refer to a trans identity. But it's also the case that journalists who call it out are now being reprimanded and penalized. Oh, check out this article. The BBC is reprimanding a journalist for the crime of telling the truth. Shocker. BBC's executive complaints unit has upheld a complaint against the Today program's co-presenter for using the following phrase, quote, trans women in other words, males, unquote. They said this breached impartiality rules. So the BBC in the UK are, they claim to be impartial. So in the centre, neither right nor left and not to give their own opinions. They claim to be neutral in the way that they present material. And apparently saying that a male is a male is not neutral. They said that using in this phrase gave the impression of endorsing one one's viewpoint in a highly controversial area. So clearly this is viewed as not only controversial, which I do agree it is controversial because of the backlash people get, but it's also viewed within the BBC as a matter of opinion, are tra trans women male or not, which is sick of it, but Orwellian people are being silenced for telling the truth. And the most integral thing to who we are as mammals, whether we're male or female, is now just a matter of opinion. It really makes you feel bleak and worried about the future. What is going to happen? And I hope the fact that at least we don't live in a society where you can't even 
acknowledge these things and talk about it, that does give me hope that we will eventually pass this era of wokeness and return to the land of objective reality and just enjoying life a little bit more, you know? Everything is just so fucking bleak. All right. Now, this next topic is probably one of the most sensitive I've spoken upon on this channel. I have not really ventured near the Israel-Palestine conflict, partly because I need I feel like I need to know more about the situation to talk about it. And also, it is just highly inflammatory. I don't know if I'm ready to go there yet. So this is sort of adjacent to that. There was an MP in the UK, so person in government, who had to step down because of or was suspended because of alleged Islamist comments. So he's being accused of Islamophobia. A conservative Ashfield MP told GB News on Friday Islamists had, quote unquote, got control of the mayor of London. He said, I don't actually believe that Islamists have control of our country, but what I do believe is that they've got control of Cannes and they've got control of London. He's actually given our capital city away to his mates. All right. So this MP made the claim that our mayor of London is being controlled by Islamists. And what's happened as a result of this is a massive debate over whether the comments are Islamophobic whether that's a representation of wider conservative party who are the dominant party in the UK of them having an Islamophobia issue, a systemic issue, and then also wide scale criticism on the prime minister, Rishi Sunak, for refusing to condemn it as Islamophobic and instead just saying it was morally wrong and not should, should not have been said. So I'm going to play two clips of Lee Anderson being interviewed on this topic defending himself, and then I'll try and argue my point and describe how I feel about the whole thing. Britain being under call and control of Islamists, and I said, no, it's not. It's not in control. Uh, the, the Islamists are not in control of the UK, but I thought that um, London and Sadiq Khan was under the control. Now, when I see the scenes out in Parliament Square last Wednesday, Patrick, where we have thousands of people and it happens every Wednesday now. It's almost every Wednesday. But when they're beaming a light onto the the um, the tower, the Elizabeth Tower, the, the Big Ben Tower, which says from the rivers to the sea, and then we see just a few months back, the whole of Whitehall was taken over. We've seen threats. We've seen wicked chants. We've seen all sorts of horrible things said on these marches around our great city, in our great city, around Parliament. Okay, so I'm just going to comment there first. So... Obviously, his intentions behind this was the protests going on in London, what sort of behavior they are creating from the free Palestine side, and the fact that they have sort of similar to the Black Lives Matter protests, created violence, disorder, they have disrupted certain areas and made it feel like you can't really go there because it's, well, first of all, it's just so busy. So central London is just taken over on Wednesdays and other days by protests. And, you know, you actually have to avoid it because it is intense. And the fact is, you know, fair enough, in October, when all this stuff happened, the right to protest is clearly a right that we should have. But All of these months on, I know that the the problem is still a major issue and I acknowledge that, but it's not really fair to live in a country where this continues to go on and is creating very negative behavior in some ways. And you don't really have the freedom and the right to just go out in the open in central London, go about your day without being confronted by it constantly. I think there needs to be more policing and rules around this whole situation. And the fact of the matter is, we now have a lot of Jewish people who fear being around certain areas. And it is a very scary time for them as well. So it, it, it's it's difficult and it's, it's a difficult issue to tackle. But not only that, MPs, people in government have been fearful of their own safety within this because there has been major controversy of the gov- people in government not calling for a ceasefire, um, not showing more support for the Palestinian side. 
So that's where his intentions have come from. But instead, the whole conversation has just gone to, can you admit it's Islamophobic? Can you admit it's Islamophobic? So attention is being drawn away from it. Let, let's watch this other clip and I'll then tell you more about what I think. It's hateful. It's inciting hatred. So when I call these people out, remember that the mayor of London is responsible for the policing of our great city. Sorry, the, the mayor of London is under the control of Islamists. That's what you said. And, right. and, and you've said you don't like the way policing is happening yeah. on all sorts of demonstrations yeah. at the moment. That's a very different thing. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not a different thing at all. So if, if, he's if not, he's, but no, you're, it's saying, not. You're, you're saying he is effectively an agent of his. No, I'm not saying that. Well, I'm he's not under said the that. control of his. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying what is, would I, what would you take see, away? You're, from? You're, you're, take, you're taking away your opinion of what I've said. So this is this is my opinion of what I said. It's, 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 the message I tried to get across is that the streets in London on certain days of the week are not in control of Mayor Khan. They're in control of the mob, the raging mob. Okay, so I'm just going to put up some videos on screen of what these mobs look like. But, okay, what do I think of this? First of all, to critique Lee Anderson, I think a lot of people can agree that he should not have made the claim in this way. The thing about it is, you have to understand the environment you're dealing with. And in this climate, there's always certain groups which are more oppressed, oppressed than others, and that we cannot speak about in as much as an openly way. So we see that for people of color, we see that for the trans community, we see that for Islam. And the fact that he chose to make a sort of sweeping statement by saying he's under control of Islamists was a bad tact. You know, he should know as an MP that if he said that, it would be divisive, it would be seen as inflammatory. And rather than people considering his viewpoint and saying, oh, wait, maybe the the mayor can do more to tackle this, then he's just been branded as Islamophobic by, it seems to me, like the majority of people. But like every situation, we have the prevailing narrative, which is Islamophobia, and that's it, and which is free Palestine, and that's it. And then you have the narratives which are not kosher to say and are not safe to say without risk of being cancelled or in some cases worse and that being being pro-Israel or talking about the fact that it's not Islamophobic it actually has some truth to it so that's one point I think he should have worded it differently so for example he could have said something like things have got out of hand in London. There are people who don't feel safe, including Jewish people and MPs, and it's also causing major disruption. Um, these are not in line with British values. We are not people who condone extremism and people chanting for jihad, which we've seen, people chanting from the river to the sea, which is very obvious. It implies the eradication of Jews in Israel. And we should not be tolerating that. And the fact that the mayor is not doing more, the mayor who is Muslim, I believe, I'll fact check that. But the fact that he's not doing more to combat this may show that he has an inherent bias towards the Islam community. And he should have very much made the distinction that he's talking specifically about Islamic extremists, of which do exist. And the fact that we have this immigration, growing immigration issue, which the country keeps voting for, but then even the Conservative Party have not managed to make any meaningful strides on this. We do, because of the policies, it is easier than you think to claim asylum in this country. And inevitably, we're going to get different characters in, some of those being extremists. And I believe that as Britain, as the UK, we should not tolerate those values whatsoever. If you're someone who's shown to be chanting for jihad and calling for eradication of Jews, then you should not be here. And that's my view on it. Like I said, rather than focusing on that issue, Sadiq Khan has come out saying, you know, we're inclusive. We don't tolerate this kind of stuff. Everyone has just been saying, is it Islamophobic? Is it Islamophobic? The words of Lee Anderson, would you regard them as Islamophobic? Well, I've been very clear that what Lee said was 
wrong, it was unacceptable, and that's why we suspended the whip. And it's important that everybody, but particularly elected politicians, are careful with their words and, and do not inflame tensions. But there's a difference between wrong and Islamophobic. Were they Islamophobic? Well, I think the, the most important thing is that the words were wrong. They were ill-judged, they were unacceptable, and that's what I believe, and that's why the whip has been suspended. So you can see... None of this is, do you think there's an issue with Sadiq Khan? Do you think that he could be doing more to control this? But it is, is it Islamophobic? Is it Islamophobic? And I don't think we're ever going to get anywhere at this because when it comes to racist, Islamophobic, transphobic, homophobic, these topics have now grown so broad that even stating a matter of opinion, such as I think Islamists have got control of Sadiq Khan, that is now apparently Islamophobic, which should be viewed as an irrational fear of Muslims or viewing Muslims as inferior to you, people that should have less rights, people that deserve violence and mistreatment. And the fact of the matter is, I believe that he does not believe this. I don't think Lee Anderson holds those opinions. I think that he is someone who lacks tact, for sure. But it goes the same for the trans community. You know, we we say that universities have, you know, you could say universities are now in control of gender ideologues and trans activists because there are scientists who've had to leave academia because they can't acknowledge that biological sex is real. And that is something that should be debated. It shouldn't be branded as transphobic and then the conversation shut down. But that is what we're seeing. And I just have an issue with it all being centered around Islamophobia because these words, unfortunately, are up to interpretation, and that is reality. There are situations in which people brand interactions as homophobic that I don't agree are homophobic. I believe that they are done with good intentions, but, you know, poor tact, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it says the bodyguards in this article for MPs as extremism threat rises, and... Security personnel working for private firms are guarding constituency surgeries and providing close protection for a growing number of politicians who are assessed to be at risk by authorities. So it's clearly an issue. When it comes to Sikh Khan and addressing some of the issues in London, I just want to play this TikTok I found of him, which is sort of telling. 2015-16, for example, there were 21,361 robberies recorded. Last year, there were 35,216, which is an increase of 65%. In that light, Mr Mayor, do you think the state in London is not less safe than when you took over was an honest thing to say? I do. And you you do? Pick it. That's so, extraordinary. I'm very happy to have a discussion on what the definition of robbery is, actually. Another statistic for you, then, which is a metropolitan police statistic. In 2015-16, there were 9,704 recorded knife crimes, and last year there were 15,003, which is an increase of 55%. Do you think the state of London is not less safe than when you took over with an honest one, honest thing to say? I think we are safer. I think uh, I'll give you I'll give you one example where you can measure success in relation to the progress we're making to deal with terrorism. Mr. Mayor, in 1516, there were 1,804 gun crimes, according to the Metropolitan Police. Last year, there were 2,342, which is an increase of 30%. So again, do you think the saying that London is not less safe now than when you took over was an honest thing to say? I do. Robbery is up, knife crime is up, rape is up, taking motor vehicle offences is up, residential burglary is up, knife crime with injury is up, knife crime with injury and robbery is up. And you think, honestly, that London is more safe now than when you took over as Mayor of London? I do. That's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. We can just see, he's, he's not even elaborating on the point of why he thinks London is more safe. But clearly this is an issue and he's not addressing it. I'm not a fan of Sikhan personally. He also has implemented quite oppressive policies about vehicles and zones in London being expanded that are not allowed to have cars with a certain level of emissions unless you pay a daily fee. And there are lots of lower income families who've been affected by this who can't afford electric vehicles yet. And there is no provision in place to help them get electric vehicles. So I very much take issue with that. And I'm very displeased at him for failing to even answer these questions in a nuanced way, saying, you know, we do need to do more. Just saying, yeah, yeah, I think London is more safe. Not exactly the qualities of a mayor that you'd want. But final point I'm going to say on this is I found this poll in The Guardian that says 40% of Conservative Party members have a negative view of Muslims. So do you have a positive or negative view of the following groups? And this is split into different categories, which surprisingly Jews are overwhelmingly positive views about Muslims. I don't 
really understand that personally. You think that would be on the lower end. But we can see that a lot of people who identify as conservative or associate themselves with that party. So we're talking about the populace, not just MPs, but they have negative views about Islam. And The Guardian is trying to claim that this is a representation of Islamophobia. Now, I highly disagree with this because just if you have negative views of Muslim, of Muslims or of Islam does not mean that you are Islamophobic necessarily. So personally, I'm gay. Now, I don't identify with the conservative party. I actually don't really identify with any of them at the moment because they're all very bleak. (laughs) However, I don't have particularly positive views about Islam. And why would I? You know, the only place, you know, the places in the world where Islam is dominant all make my existence as a gay man illegal. Lots of them would murder me. Iran would force me to either be killed, be put in prison, or the other option would be to transition and have my penis removed and live as a woman. So, you know, this relates to the whole Queers for Palestine movement. And throughout this whole thing, I just want to say that, of course, I would very much hope there is a way for this Israel-Palestine conflict to progress without what's happening in Gaza. Now, I don't understand the complexities of foreign policy and war. And I do believe that obviously Israel had a right to defend itself after that, according to international law. But I would obviously suspect and very much hope that there is another way than what's going on. And I think it is a complete tragedy what's going on. Now, does that mean that I would resonate with the people in Gaza? Probably not. I mean, I think that the polls overwhelmingly state there that being gay is a sin, being gay should be met with punishment. And the fact of the matter is, because, you know, I've listened to some podcasts where people have defected from Muslim, and Muslim from Islam. I always get those two things mixed up. But they are no longer, they're ex-Muslim. That's what I was trying to say. And they have very logical arguments that say it's very difficult to separate the doctrine of Islam from extremism. Now, I'm not going to say I agree with that because I need to know more about it. But apparently they argue that we see more extremism within this religion because of the doctrine it possesses. So the fact of the matter is this religion, the doctrine views my sexuality in an extremely negative light. I am not able to travel to any of these countries. You know, hell no, am I going to Dubai, any of these places, Egypt, um, the list goes on. But of course, I'm going to be more cautious of Muslim people in London and the UK. Now, I've met lots of Muslim people that I really like and that I get on with. Who knows if we would vibe enough to be close friends. I'm open to it. But And of course, I believe that if you are Muslim and you agree with gay people, then that's great. But as a whole, I'm going to be more cautious around people who believe in Islam. I don't understand the whole hijab, like burqa situation. I think that organized religion has a history of finding ways to oppress women. One of them being getting women to cover themselves, having to cover a part of their body in order to walk around in society. I don't get it. To me, it does come across as oppressive, but I also acknowledge that many women don't feel that way and they really like it. And I believe that. I think that they should have a right to believe that, of course. But that's my opinion on it. Like, I don't have particularly positive views on Islam. And why would I? Why would I? I can say the exact same thing for Catholicism, which I was raised as. I don't have positive views about Catholicism or Christianity. Now, my views towards Islam are probably more negative because we don't see Christians anywhere murdering gay people. We can live in, we can co-inhabit spaces peacefully. And we don't see Christian-dominated countries doing these things. But, you know, I can say that Due to what happened with Catholic priests abusing young children, I don't have any, I don't want to associate myself whatsoever with that religion. And the fact of the matter is I'm not religious anyway, but they also don't agree necessarily with the concept of being gay, even though the Pope has recently, um, you know, sort of gave it its blessing, which is very kind of him. But 
I feel like me saying that is not controversial and people are not going to say, oh, you're saying all priests are pedophiles. No, it's very clear I'm not. And the same with Lee Anderson. He's not suggesting that all Muslim people are like this. So that was a pretty big one. I'm very intrigued to know your thoughts on all this because I'm still learning about some of this and very open to my mind being changed. But please let me know in the comments. Hopefully we can talk about it in a balanced way. But yeah, I'm very curious to know about that one. Okay, guys, we have come to reacting to woke TikToks. And I've decided I'm going to do themes for these because I do focus a lot on gender stuff. There's lots of other woke ideas in the realm of TikTok. But we are going to stick to some of the gender stuff today because we have not talked about this enough, apparently. And the theme today is Transhausen by proxy, meaning Munchausen by proxy is... Actually, let's just watch the first one and then we can discuss. I'm going to narrate this as a cringe woke mother myself because audio listeners, there is no vocal and it is pretty bleak. In 2022, our twin daughters came to us and told us they didn't feel like the genders that were given to them. Our son told us that he was transgender and our child told us they didn't feel like a boy or a girl. I trusted them and from that day on, our family changed in the most beautiful way. People said we were crazy to listen to them. They're just kids. They don't understand who they are. They do. It's been two years today, and my children are thriving. They are happy and free and their true selves. They have amazing hearts and are an inspiration to me every day. I honestly thought that was never going to end. I'm going to have to cut some of that out because it's actually kind of boring at the same time as super disturbing. But for audio listeners, this is a family where... They have four children. And guess what? All of them happen to be trans. I saw a Twitter post on this saying the chance of having a trans child is, you know, one in 0.001% or whatever. And they basically (laughs) said, if you have four trans children, then it's the chances of having that are one in something billion. And the video is just saying, you know, people have challenged us saying they don't know who they really are. They're just kids, but they do. And they're thriving. They're happier than ever, which may be the case. They may be happy. Partly because they might be getting lots of attention for adopting these identities. But the problem I do have is that this may then lead to the medicalization of all four of them and the blocking of all four of theirs puberty, and then going on cross-sex hormones, and then some of them eventually detransitioning. But just like I kind of referred to earlier, so Munchausen's by proxy, if you don't know what that is, is when a parent has some sort of disorder or demon inside of them that they actively want to make their child sick or a medical case. So there was the case of that Gypsy Rose girl who, you know, was released from prison where her mom medicalized her all her life, her childhood, because her mom wanted her to be sick and look after her, even though she had no medical issues. She had surgeries, she had loads of drugs pumped into her, and this led to her eventually murdering her mom because of the abuse. And people have been referring to this as trans housing by proxy. And we all know the classic Blair White tweet of a trans child is like a vegan cat. We all know who's making the lifestyle choices. And I just don't see any other way that parents can be making these choices for kids that doesn't say it's more about them than it is about the child. How can a four-year-old, a five-year-old know that they want to transition to the opposite sex? It's literally impossible. If a child comes out with the fact that they are, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, you don't just blindly affirm that. You say, no, you're a boy, but you can do all of these things. And one of your child comes out as trans and, oh my God, now we have something interesting about our family. We're not just boring white people (laughs) that are now being looked down upon for our privilege, privilege. And now we can finally have this diverse case and... I just can't with this. 
I strongly believe that this is child abuse. I think any child being affirmed in a trans identity is child abuse. I think any child being put on a medical pathway is child abuse. And it is the opposite of what we should be doing in normalizing gender nonconformity. You can be a boy, but you can dress however you like. You can wear whatever you like. You could even maybe change your name, but you're still a boy. You're still a he, him. And if you get to 18 and you have therapy and you make the decision, I still want to transition and you understand the complexities of that and that the world won't always validate your identity. There's going to be people who will never validate your identity. You're going to have the complications of sports, of women, of, of single sex spaces, of the discourse. It's not even just the irreversible medicalization and removing of body parts. It's that living as a trans person is not easy. And kids don't understand that. Kids make choices all the time that they don't, you know, it's it's known psychologically that kids don't understand consequences. And just, whoops, oh my God, another trans child, our fourth trans child, what are the chances? We're so blessed. These parents are deranged. And you can see that, of course, they're all re- wearing masks. In 2024, they're all wearing masks, COVID masks, at the hairdresser, outside. Somehow all of these lifestyle choices just happen to cluster together next one this trans mama asks that if her daughter is starting to wear more masculine clothing is that a sign of detransitioning absolutely not most likely your child is experiencing the fluidity of gender when it comes to clothing so first of all If you have a trans child or a trans adult in your life, unless they specifically say that they are detransitioning and no longer trans, it's not detransitioning. When it comes to clothing, clothing isn't gendered at all. Think about how many women in your life wear pants, like to wear suits. Back in the day, that wasn't allowed because that was considered man's clothing. But take off your goggles of gender binary saying that men should look like this and women should look like this because sometimes that only relates to trans people. And look at all of the other women in your life. Think about what they're wearing and then look at your child and say, yeah, but... Maybe she's just trying to be expressive in in the way that that is unique to her. And definitely... I actually have to stop this woman because I'm getting so angry. My skin is literally crawling watching these videos. I can't... Like, this woman has every typically female characteristic and then her pronouns are he, him. There's a little trans flag. My pronouns are he, him. She's responding to a comment that says, my daughter, age five is trans and is starting to want to wear more masculine clothing. Is this a sign that they are detransitioning? And then we have this one being like, no, that's not a sign. Clothing, remember, clothing is not gendered. And it's funny how you harp back to the battle for women's rights wanting to wear pants because now everything seems to be very anti those things. You know, take women's spaces away from men. Oh, if you are a woman and you're more masculine, get your breasts cut off. And if you're not basing a child's gender identity on their clothing and their activities, what are you basing it off? Because your child says, I'm a girl. And the only way you can describe a gender identity without saying, oh, well, you know, you can't describe it. It's just a nebulous concept of a sex soul. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that you might relate more to masculine things then we're just back to gender expression and preferences, toys. So the only way a child finds its way into being trans is through these very basic, reductive ideas of you have to like Barbies or you have to like wearing dresses. But then because this boy is actually wanting to wear boys' clothes again, this mother is asking someone on TikTok, which you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be getting parental advice from this deranged he, him. Who's then saying, no, 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 no. Your child is still trans. Like it's this, it's this need and desperation for these people to believe that the kids are trans. Why don't, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to actively want to have a trans kid. I don't want to have a child that has to go through suffering and judgment and medicalization for their whole life. 
who would want that? Like, sure, if I had a child and when they got older and they, you know, really knew it was the right decision for them and they were happy, then I would support that. I wouldn't disown them or look down on them necessarily. But what is this obsession with wanting to have a trans child and abuse your kids? It is, it's so horrible that you are sacrificing your child's safety, your child's grip on reality, your child's ability to live some of its adequate life without drugs pumped into their system for the sake of you being virtuous and woke. It's disgusting. This next one is not a TikTok, but it might as well be because it's equally as deranged. My name is Elise Flatland. I have been a resident of Kansas for the last 20 years. I have four children, two girls, two boys. My oldest is my transgender daughter, and my youngest is an 11-year-old transgender boy. Both of, my boy, both of my children have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, and both are currently receiving gender-affirming care. Through this care, my husband and my consent has always been required. They have asked my children what they envision their bodies looking like as an adult, and never once did they mention surgery to my children. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they won't, does it? We are well aware of what is going on with our children. It is not the government's job to decide on the best medical care for citizens. But it is the government's job to stop child abuse. And that's why this is a topic of conversation. You know, I fully believe in freedom and autonomy and not taking rights away from people. But there's a reason why governments impose laws that say children cannot consent to sex because children cannot consent to lifelong medicalization and removing parts of their body. And I hate to keep harping back to this, but you always just see these trends. Of course, this mother has purple hair. Treating gender dysphoria it has widely accepted guidelines for care. It does not need to be scrutinized by non-medical yeah. experts in government. Okay, so everything can be scrutinized. Girl. <clears throat> everything is open for debate. There's not a single medical practice that should not be able to be criticized. You know, people criticize antidepressants all the time. People criticize different types of surgeries, whether they actually work, whether they're ethical. Everything should be open for criticism. And through the evolution of medicine, there's always been things that we've thought are a good idea and are not. Electroshock therapy, lobotomies, drugs that have made babies be deformed when they come out. If we couldn't criticize medicine, then we would never progress and stop abusing people having people's lives be destroyed by the medical system. And these guidelines you're talking about by WPATH, the world, I'm not even going to bother to say it, the Transgender Health Guidelines body are run by activists and ideologues who have a bias. They shouldn't be, they should be run by scientists who do objective clinical studies. But instead, when you look at all the studies, you can see how biased they are. All parents make non-reversible choices for their children. I make choices every day that will affect my children's future. That is my job. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that you do. As a mother, it is my responsibility to work with medical professionals and decide what is best for the health of my children. I mean, at least she's determined. It is my responsibility to work with medical professionals. I am outraged that this is even a discussion I have to have. We are too. The mental, emotional, and social well-being of transgender su children suffers when their medical care is threatened. These children deserve to live their lives with dignity, con di dignity, confidence, and pride. I mean, she's clearly really nervous, which I guess it doesn't really add to the conversation. But sure, if you don't affirm a child's fantasy, then they might suffer a bit. And it might be distressing, but what you could do instead is get them therapy from a non-woke therapist to actually explore why they're feeling that way. And then they may not need to be medicalized for life. But the thing is, you know, I've heard lots of people say this, is that if you're a parent and you transition your child, then 
you only really have one option is to stay resolute in that decision for the rest of your life. Because as soon as you acknowledge that there's more to it, then you are acknowledging that you have abused your child. And I can understand why that might be difficult for someone to acknowledge, but it's about the child's safety, not your ability to accept that you're abusive. Okay, this <laughs> this one is just mind-numbing. Stop telling your trans kids, I love you no matter what. This is something that a lot of parents say after their kid comes out to them as gay or trans, and they really mean well. What you're really saying and what your kid is hearing is, I love you even though you're trans. And the even though part and the no matter what part implies something bad or wrong or maybe something that needs to be overlooked for you to love. And that's not unconditional love. Those are conditions. Those are strings attached. A better way to tell your kids that you love them unconditionally is say, I love you for who you are, or I love every part of you because your kids need to know that you really do. I've never felt more uncomfortable <laughs> watching woke TikToks. You can just see that wokeness is this never ending battle to just dismantle anything good, anything pure, anything simple and uncontroversial in the name of political correctness. So now it's telling a child, I love you no matter what, is somehow transphobic, is somehow problematic. I get your life in check. The fact that you feel you need to come online and educate parents on the dangers of telling a child, I love you no matter what, because of this arbitrary, like what's the difference between saying, I love you for just who you are? Like there is no difference. It's like people saying, that there's this huge difference between person of color and a colored person. And one is just completely racist and the other one is completely correct. People are just making up these rules. Microaggressions, you know, all of this stuff. And it's gross. It's gross. Before Edie came out to us and we as a family went on this journey together, we had no experience or understanding of what it meant to be trans. I still can't help but imagine my two daughters being married and my two sons do. marrying. If either of my children became gay, I'd be like, okay with that, that's fine, no problem. But if them changed their gender identity, I would be paused for a moment and I would, I would have to evolve. It wasn't easy to change my entire perception of gender. I was in my 40s and I lived a life with a set of ideas and my own ignorance of what trans people's lives are actually like. Edie <laughs> doesn't want to be trans. She just wants to be a girl. As things progressed over the years, we... But somehow a girl is just being able to wear dresses. I have reacted to this family before in my Why Gender Ideology is the New Homophobia video. And the child says... I don't want to be a girl because I don't like football and I don't like getting hurt. But somehow you had to wake up from your ideas of what gender was. And now that is based off purely stereotypical characteristics. And look, I just can't stand this family and this guy. You can see his TikTok. His whole TikTok is just of his now daughter, female identifying child, Edie, Every single video is about her, and it's it, about the child. And it's very clear that he is getting clicks, he's getting views, he's probably getting money from doing this. And it is complete exploitation. I think even if you very irresponsibly and abusively transition your child and set them on this pathway, what really puts the icing on the cake is then exploiting that for your own clout and your own fame, and your own money. It's gross. And he just, he really makes my skin crawl. Like everything, I'm not going to dig in with ad hominems because I'm trying to be nicer, but just everything about him makes, I, I, it's very hard for me to listen to his voice. And him then coming out as non-binary, like, fuck you. You are not LGBT. You are not in the same experience Venn diagram is me. You are a person that is obsessed with attention, with fame, with your deranged ideas. 
And I really hope this child does not get set on the medical pathway before the child is too, before the child is old enough to understand what they're doing. And I wouldn't be surprised if this massively severs a relationship down further down the line. Kids don't know they're being abused when they're a kid. They think that this is normal. We decided to seek out professional help in the form of a gender clinic. There's so much noise in the media about trans children and the danger surrounding them. Oh yeah, of course the child is already at the gender clinic. How old is this child? Like eight? And they're already being brought to a doctor to be medicalized? And of course it's probably just someone who's going to affirm more than a little concerned. Then we got the news. We were doing exactly what Edie needed. We were supporting her and loving her and other than that, there was nothing else to do. Now in a few years, we will be in a different position and some difficult choices will need to be made. That's a long way off. I hope this helped. Yeah, we can all know what those choices are going to be. Jonathan Jolie. It just makes me so mad. All I see here, like I actually just got chills. All I see here is a gay boy who is very hyper-feminine and whose family are exploiting him in the name of wokeness, in the name of liberalism, in the name of diversity and money and online fame. And if you're going to pump your child with puberty blockers and hormones, then fuck you. You are converting what is likely a gay child. And who knows, maybe the child would grow up to say, actually, no, I still want to transition. But if you're cementing in this idea and embedding it in the child, everything, to, you know, years go by. And then it's very hard for the child to envision a life where you're not she, her, not a girl. But if you would just let the child express themselves however they like, while still being a boy, that is a sign of good parenting. But all I see is a self selfish, self-involved father who is deranged. We're living in opposite land, everyone, and it's full of woke gremlins wanting to dismantle so many things about what is good in society, what is positive in society, what is sane in society. <sighs> That's all I have to say on that. Listen, everyone, it's been... I'm not going to say it's been fun because the stories today have been very emotionally provoking and this has been one hell of a long podcast but i hope you enjoyed and i'd be very interested to know what you think please subscribe to my channel if you're watching on youtube and you listen this long please give me a rating on apple Podcasts and spotify and with that said i will see you in the next episode yeah!